So, Candy, thank you so much for joining me. You have a brand new book out, which is called Sister, Sister. Yes, I do. So I'm really excited to chat to you about it. To start with, yeah. give us a feel of why it's called Sister, Sister. Um, Sister, Sister, um, with the sisters spelled in different ways. The first sister being S-I-S-T-A. Yeah, I have to look over there. And the second one, S-I-S-T-E-R. Um, so a lot of the way I write is very with uh, black, females being the main character although I found especially with my first book I'm not your baby mother it's had such a universal audience that when I wanted to write about the things I've learned the hard way like becoming going from a black teenage girl to a black woman I had to recognize that there are many more versions of women or people that are going to read this story and sister ta is how I would speak to my black sisters like girl you know that way but it's I felt like I wanted a title that could speak to everyone. So it's like, sister, as in, yes, if you look like me, this book may resonate more with you, but sister ER, this is still really educational material if this hasn't been your life experience. And you have managed to brilliantly, Mm -hmm. as a writer and a TV presenter, um, not fit into necessarily the boxes that everyone wants to put people in Mm -hmm. so you know you're an expert on the racial inequality of motherhood you're an expert on style (laughs) like you you've got all those wonderful things so how have you managed to take those facets of yourself and make sure that people don't try and reduce you to one part by constantly bringing those different versions of myself to the table I think especially in like a social media space we are getting far too comfortable with only seeing one version of a person and so when then you see let's say a beauty influencer talk up about inequality when for years you've just been following them for foundation recommendations there's a huge uproar it's like this is not your place you know there's a lot of that kind of screaming because I think you know through a phone screen we expect people to be one dimensional and so I always try to make sure when building this career that yeah I'm a mum but I like to look fly but I'm gonna speak about the inequalities surrounding being black way before we had a George Floyd moment and I hope that humanizes me in a certain way and what that then does in a career space it means you can't pigeonhole someone or be like oh well candy shouldn't be speaking about this subject because we only follow her for Mm. her motherhood content you know and that but that also means that you have to be willing to um to not appeal to everyone because people like a box they like when you tick one thing or you make them feel one certain way and the truth is if you read my work or you follow the things I talk about be that in a magazine or you know certain shows I'm working on you're going your mind's going to be stretched at times it's not just going to be this red lipstick is really good with your hair tone it's going to be stuff that makes you feel uncomfortable and feeling uncomfortable is not a popular thing Mm. no one no, no, no one wants to feel that. No one wants to like pick up their phone and it's been a really long day and then be met with the idea that maybe there is a privilege that needs to be discussed or maybe there is a way um, where you have to admit you've not been the ally you think you have. Who wants to do that? Absolutely no one. So that means that maybe I won't have an audience of 10 million because I'm not always gonna make you smile but that's fine because then I go to bed smiling because I'm like, I'm giving you the many options of me that are available and hopefully you can learn something from that. Hmm. Yeah. And you took kind of a a big step in forging this career, quitting your job and (laughs) becoming your own boss. (laughs) What advice do you give to other women who like like the idea of that step or even have Mm. a specific idea in mind, but obviously are a bit anxious about that leap? save your money honey (laughs) like i just made that step with no savings just like oh i'm just not coming back to work today very pisces of me um i would say like save as much money as you can uh remember to have a strategy which i'm not very good at and if you aren't good at that surround yourself with people that are maybe that's your partner or a friend but we you know i'm 
as people were reading this book, I'm all about the woo-woo and the magical energy. And my husband's like, mm-hmm. The woo-woo is not working in this this column, you know? Like, how can we make this slightly logical? You're going to need all of those elements. Because I think we have this idea of being our, our own boss based on our strengths, not our weaknesses. And when you've got no one to plug those gaps, those weaknesses get bigger and bigger. So even if you want to be your own boss, who can you partner with in that moment? And as time goes on, who can you hire to make sure that every hole is plugged, you know? It's just, you know, and I know the term girl boss is having like a moment, like a cancellation. We don't want to speak about that anymore. There is still room to be a girl boss, but, female or not if that's how you identify no one is a boss alone it's just it's actually impossible so yes make that leap and decide that you want to like um build your own legacy or have your own business but to be a great boss you need to be working with really great people who aren't ashamed to call you out on your crap like that's not logical that's not gonna work that's not a great long-term plan that is a lot of advice (laughs) (laughs) last piece though is really hard because you've got to both have conviction and also be happy to have someone call you out how how do you balance that how do you balance like always checking your checking your ego i'm getting into the habit of understanding when what i'm saying is coming from like this really almost god delusion type place and understanding where that has its place and where it's like i can't make a decision from that standpoint what's best for the business in terms of the financials or how everyone's going to be feeling emotionally you have to also like step into that box as well but so much of it and i you know i i know i bang on about this so much of it again is social media it's like me 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 likes 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 engagement applaud me like 90 percent of my business is me crying into a pillow being like, how am I gonna pull this off? Or how are we gonna make this work? And because again, that's not the popular stuff on social media, we only ever see the wins, mm. the BAFTAs, the mansion, the, you only, you don't see the red letters, you don't see the 10 rejections, you don't see someone like going really far with a project and then it not being greenlit. We don't see that enough. And I think if we did, like everyone would, Um, feel a lot more comfortable like setting their ego aside and being like what's going to work best for my business or how I'm working or even the hobby that I want to turn into a business but because failure is still not cool Mm. um, you can get really deluded you can think everyone's got this going on I'm lagging behind there's like a time ticker as well like oh I'm 30 this I'm 40 that I'm 50 has my time but it's like it's a lot and you have to Your conviction has to be borderline crazy. Mm. Because in the early days, and when I say days, I mean years, I think for five years, there were friends behind my back and to my face who were like, you've lost the plot. You've actually, you had a great job in publishing and industry people will kill to get into. That's like the common line. Mm. Everyone wants to work in publishing, right? It feels like it has an iron gate. And you walked away from that to do what? To tweet? that's how it sounded at the time right and you've got to get comfortable with people writing you off as crazy until in their minds it makes sense Mm. yeah (laughs) (laughs) and with that kind of time ticker and that kind of sense of mortality in the book there is that there is that chapter about death which covers Mm. grief but also that kind of sense that you've always had that kind of curiosity and interest and intrigue in the idea of mortality so yeah. tell me a bit about where you go with that in in the book where do I go with that in the book so my dad passed away when I died I don't like that term. my dad died when I was 20 and he died really suddenly he got the flu it turned into like pneumonia and one minute he was driving himself to hospital then he died of cardiac arrest in the waiting room really sudden really brutal And when you're 20 and you're just drinking yourself into oblivion on the weekend and the only thing you care about is your new fast fashion outfit, 
a death like that is like the Hulk's fist coming through a wall. And you're just like, oh, I'm not the most important thing in the world. And not only is that now a fact, this can go left at any time. Mm -hmm. So as I move through grief in that chapter, I try to let readers understand that we wouldn't, I wouldn't even be able to produce work like this without that happening so early in my life because it just put fire up my backside. I was like, oh, this death thing's a real thing. Like this isn't some far removed thing that happens in movies or to like your 99 year old grandmother, anytime, any place, anyone can get it as the saying goes. I was like, okay, you need to get your skates on because one of my worst fears is like that happening and I didn't fulfill myself. Mm. And that sounds very sacred and very icky, but it's like who wants to go out not doing what they want to do or tr at least trying to be happy D do I feel like my dad it didn't get that yeah I do I feel like there was so much living for um his community his family the idea of being successful and what that represented as a first generation Jamaican boy you know I feel like there was a lot of that I, I feel like he didn't do enough or a lot for himself and now I'm a little bit older and I've got kids of my own. I'm like, okay, I, I never want to lose that sense of fears. We are going to ride this thing until the wheels pop off. And like, hopefully when my time comes, I can be like, yeah, get me out of here, mate. I am so tired. Like I'm on repeat now. We're, we're, I'm over this situation. <laughs> um, and that's what grief taught me. And so I didn't want that chapter to be just like doom and gloom. I wanted people who haven't had that experience yet to maybe hold that in the back of their mind. So when that time does come for them, maybe them losing a loved one or a family member, they're like, let this just be a reminder that, you know, maybe it's time to quit that job mm. or leave that partner or, you know, even pick up a hobby because you just you just don't know when that time is gonna be up. Mm. And so for you, that, that time pressure that we all feel to some extent in different ways, mm. is it based much more on mortality than it is on getting old, which I think is some oh, people's yeah. fears. Oh, no, 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 I can't wait to get old. I remember when I was like, I think I was like 23, I tried to dye my hair grey, it just wouldn't happen. <laughs> I think there is such a regalness to being old. I, I can't speak for every community, but especially in the black community, like when I see a black woman in her 60s and she's got this cute grey crop cut, I'm just like, I'm dying to be you because you look so self-assured and like, you know, and there's just no sweat with them. It's very like, they've quite literally seen it all and like, they're like, I know that this moment will pass and I, I can't wait to have that moment. So it's never about age for me. Can't wait to be like the old auntie at parties. It definitely is more death and mortality and mm. that to a point that, People often ask, oh, what would you be doing if you weren't doing this? I would be a mortician. That is absolutely one of my dream jobs. And if I could like add an extra hour to my day, I would like to train in that. There is something I think very beautiful about being that pathway to whatever is on the other side, like taking care of that human body and presenting it for a family. Mm. That to me is just, that is the job of all jobs. So that is like, it's obviously something I have a weird thing for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's such an interesting topic because some people, you know, it can be really hard to confront, but you've sort yeah. of taken it. Oh that. yeah, my husband will not speak about death at all. He's like, no, nope, won't speak of it. I'm like, fine, I'll write the will then. That's quite helpful for me, because then I'll just, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be like, yeah. <laughs> And you mentioned the kind of the woo-woo stuff yeah. earlier that you said you and her husband also differ on. Yeah. And there's a chapter in the book on man manifestation. Mm. Um, and I wondered, because it's, I'm on the sort of side of like, I, I, I do kind of want to believe it, yeah. but I don't know if I'll let myself believe it. Mm. And that's because I worry that if I let myself believe that stuff will just happen, mm. that I'll be even more inclined to be like, oh, it actually works so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you balance that? How do you... I balance that. Um, I know what you mean about not wanting to work so hard, but the thing is, when those when those things that you truly desire for yourself 
start to unravel be that via hard work manifestation it's always a combination of the two you do just naturally work harder because you're like oh my gosh I really enjoy my job I really love my life like everywhere I go I'll leave lots of situations and people like were like oh my god you bought such a spark such a joy I'm like I love waking up in the morning and that's not to say I'm a morning person but every day I wake up and I'm like I'm me, cool, I'm live. I'm having the time of my life, I'm doing one of the best jobs in the world, you just walk differently, I will stay up till 2am editing, because I'm doing exactly what I feel like I should be doing, so in no way do I think using manifestation practices or the woo-woo would make anyone lazy, okay, it actually just know. ramps you up you're ramped up because you're like okay if i give 110 percent and also do these things you want to tell me that i can like upscale my life in this way or leave this job or feel better about this situation it's mind-blowing as time goes on do i necessarily have to work as hard as i did 10 years ago no but the work is just happening in a different way it's not me like running through Victoria Station sweating because I'm about to be late to collect my kid from school because I couldn't leave the office. It is me sitting down and thinking about how I build up the confidence maybe to let someone go because they don't fit my business structure anymore. Like that's a different kind of work to be fair. Yeah, completely. And in this book, you you managed to cover things like manifestation, but also, as you mentioned at the start, um, colorism yeah. and um, a lot of different types of racism as well, mm. which is obviously a separate thing. So on the colorism side of things, why was that so important for you to be a part of this book? Colorism for me, number one, I, when we speak about colorism, I am like the, um, I'm the one that feels that pinch the hardest. And I feel like, I think I said it in the book, if 2020 was the year of like, okay, we're gonna have, we're gonna discuss racism, 2021 has to be the year that especially um, communities that are largely um, described as minority um, have that conversation within themselves. Because colorism being that someone is judged or looked down upon because their skin is a darker shade runs rampant in Asian communities, in black communities, like, it's a massive, massive problem. And it's something that I think easily gets brushed aside because again, when we talk about the blanket terms of privilege, if you're having a good time, why do you care that I have not been able to get a job because my skin is darker than someone else's? It doesn't affect you, so you're not bothered. So it's very like, hush, hush, darling, let's keep this down. But it's affecting so many people and it's something that I felt was really important I put in this book because sometimes you need to just like drop the egg on the floor. A bit like with I'm Not Your Baby Mother, I, so many black people were like, oh my God, I can't believe you brought those topics to the forefront because in our community, it's very like, that's inside business. You do not have that conversation in front of any other community. And I'm, I'm getting into a really good habit of doing that. I'm like, okay, so the shame has to die and we have to like open this egg in front of everyone and dissect it so that we can all be a part of like crumbling this way of thinking. There are so many um, white friends I have who have read the book who are like, colorism, gee, like, just mm. no idea that was a thing. And now I know it's a thing. I see it everywhere. I see it yeah. in music videos, on TV, in, in who's allowed to be number one in the music charts. It's absolutely everywhere. And you cannot try to change something you're not aware of. So I just felt like it was important to put that in there. Yeah. yeah. But it's also got your trademark kind of humour in there, mm. as well as that kind of, um, that really kind of, like, honest openness. Yeah. And I do want to say, I did actually read it cover to cover, and when yeah. I closed it, I, I said audibly, that's such a good book. Yeah! Which is not <laughs> something I generally do. Um, and also do want to go back through it with a highlighter. Yes. So you've succeeded there as well. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful chat. It's oh, been thank such you for a pleasure. Me. It's been amazing. Thank you.